And here we are. So welcome to the latest in our um, English touring operas series of In Conversation With. Uh, I'm really excited about this evening because we have an absolutely amazing lineup. Uh, my name is Bradley Travis and I'm the associate artist here at English Touring Opera. But we're joined to talk about um, getting back to live performance, really. And I'm delighted that we're joined by the director of opera at Opera Holland Park, James Clutton. Good evening, James. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, and we're also joined by wonderful mezzo-soprano Yvonne Howard. Good evening, Yvonne. Uh, and also fantastic conductor John Andrews, who's worked with ETO many times. Good evening, John. Good evening, Bradley. Nice to be here. And also, of course, with our artistic director, James Conway. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you're with us on Zoom, then just go to the top right corner of the screen and go to speaker view, because that'll give you a better experience. We'd love you to get involved in the conversation. So if you'd like to just put it in the live chat function, I'll try and bring it into the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but Holland Park, did a wonderful thing of getting back going on Saturday with their homecoming concert. I think a very emotional occasion. And they've got three more concerts. They've got a lovely, um, relaxed performance of the Pir Pirates of Penzance called The Pirates Return, and then two other concerts. Um, one of them featuring both Yvonne and John Andrews, which will be a lovely operetta concert. But I'm going to now hand over to our artistic director, James Conway. Good evening, James. Oh, he's muted. No, oh, he's muted. That's good. Mm. To remember that always. Um, uh, good evening to you all. But I would like to start by asking people to please, in the chat column, say which British monarch John Andrews most closely resembles <laughs> his current facial configuration. Um, I've already worked it out, but uh, then even as I even as I thought of it, the sweeping back hair suggested a couple of other figures from a more distant past. Congratulations, John, on your um, assembly. Very beautiful. Thank you. As we say in English. I, I shouldn't, I can't take all the credit. It's mainly my children's doing because they <laughs> this uh, configuration and I've always had the excuse uh, of needing to be at least a little bit smart to perform in public. But for the last four months, I've had I've had no comeback to them, so they've had their own way. But on, on the 7th of August, Mr. Clutton gets the, the honor of seeing the, uh, the neater version. Oh, does that mean you're gonna shave? Trim. Trim, oh, I see, oh, I see. Because it is quite, it's estimable. Impressive. Now, uh, Mm, I should get down to business here and ask some intelligent questions. I was trying to think of a few. Um, <laughs> and they, of course, eluded me. I, this afternoon, I was on a panel at a tete-a-tete -tete stroke OMTF meeting about kind of getting back to live performance and so on. Um, and uh, Julie was there, I think. I think I remember seeing Julie on her couch. So maybe, and maybe somebody else was in that conversation as well. So I better tell no tales since there are witnesses. Um, uh, James, how was it? The first one. You know what, James? It was a weird thing because really you and I, and um, if we were talking about putting a concert on with a, a chamber orchestra of nine and 12 singers or whatever great they were and they all were great and a, and a conductor. And that's the sort of thing that people like you and me do in our sleep. We could do that easy. It's a throwaway thing. It took on incredible levels of weight and emotion because it was the first thing that most people had done or seen. So it was a really very, very surreal experience for me standing in where we normally have a thousand seat theater, having 200 people, being open to the rain, although it stopped raining at five to six when we started at six <laughs> and, and absolutely torrential at eight o'clock. So I'm doing something OK. Um, but the rest of it was it, it just had an incredible weight to it, because I think that we've really all suddenly realised, I mean, we realised before, but just how much we've all missed listening and watching live music or me producing it. And it was just it came with this incredible weight of emotion and, and power that was pretty unexpected just the sheer level of it so it was very good it was a great it was a great day uh, but it had a it had a different sort of emotion to it than a concert like that would normally have well congratulations for 
you know, for doing it, for risking it, and for bribing the weather people so effectively. Um, <clears throat> I always knew that you had connections, James, but it's <laughs> really, uh, a different league. Um, but um, it, it is so important to start back live. I mean, John and Yvonne, uh, two busy artists, um, uh, both, both of you have, um, are, for me, a very special association, a, a personal association, as well as an association with English Touring Opera. You're both friends. John, you've conducted so many marvelous things for us. You've gone on very long tours uh, as an assistant conductor to begin with, and then uh, conducting especially Bel Canto for us so estimably. And Yvonne, since I was, uh, since you were probably 18 and I was 30 or something like that, oh. <laughs> um, you. you've been just one of my favorite artists. You never make a sound that isn't beautiful. Um, uh, you're always alive and engaging and present on stage generous with yourself on stage, which I think I, I can always tell when somebody walks on stage if they're a generous person or not, if they can actually bring themselves to the stage. And so few people actually know how to make an entrance or make an exit when, when that's one of the most important things you do apart from singing beautifully. Anyway, mm -hmm. I've always esteemed you and we've worked together since my days in Ireland when, do you remember our Rodolinda? Rodolinda, yeah. So exceptional and your anger with a handful of turmeric and a white mattress on a red floor. Holy cow, that was passion. Don't cross me. <laughs> well, I think Nick Sears was afraid of crossing you. <laughs> Don't blame him. <laughs> but, um, and that we, was some show. That was that really some was show, and uh, I inflicted it on various other countries at different times, as you know. But, um, uh, the only thing I've ever managed to get you for at ETO, because you're always so blooming busy, uh, was um, Norma. And mm -hmm. I think it was your first Norma. It uh, was. And then you went on to do Norma at Holland Park. Oh, so I did, yeah. <laughs> a kind of synergy there, because James and I, among opera managers, I flatter myself that we're friends, because <laughs> I've always respected what you've done there. You've transformed the joint. And... Transformation is the name of the game. I mean, thanks, James. Right back happens. at you. Right back at you. I think that I wanted to say um, quickly, if I may, that um, James and I have been speaking throughout this period because obviously it's been an incredible period for freelancers and for audiences, but uh, it's a different kind of strangeness for people who run opera companies. And um, now and again, it's just been lovely to just get on the phone and say, are you having as bad a day as I'm having? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And it's just that something about that, which is just a an unofficial support group or, or whatever you'd call it, but just going to someone who has very similar issues and problems to you and knowing that you're not on your own, um, especially at the top of a company, just really has been lovely, James. I've loved, always loved catching up with you. But in this, we've had a couple of chats where we've, one of us has been lower than the other and we've lifted the other one and vice versa. But I think it's just been... It's so important and it's so easy to see different companies as rivals rather than colleagues and uh, i always love what eto do and i think that, that just the fact that you and i can get on the phone to each other and ask serious questions about problems we're having has always been wonderful for me anyway well we also know that we don't have to go through seven minutes of bullshit before we get to the issue <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we shouldn't speak of that too much well, we had a chat the other day that was was less than five seconds bullshit before we started moaning about everyone and everything so that was all right <laughs> um john and yvonne how has this time been for you john you go first oh thank you um <laughs> it it's i count myself extraordinarily lucky given what other colleagues have been through what the profession's going through. Um, I'm here in London. My kids have been magnificent. They're old enough to have been self-sufficient through having to deal with school at home. They're young enough not to be facing any imminent exams. So from a personal point of view, that's so much of, of what a lot of people have struggled with that's been easy for me. Um, I've also been incredibly lucky Every company I worked for has dealt with me incredibly generously. Um, 
we won't, you know, we'll spare blushes around this discussion, but everybody has, uh, has been more generous than I could have ever imagined. Um, I've also been lucky that uh, a recording I did last year came out in the middle of this, so that uh, it meant that there was the things for me to be doing. Uh, a recording I made in January is coming out next month, so I've been dealing with the edits to that, with the program notes, so my, my brain hasn't gone completely to pieces. Um, I was also very fortunate to spend two days back in the recording studio last month when um, film recordings became possible again. I went and did two days on a, a, on a new film, recording the soundtrack for that. So there's been just enough in my life to, to stop me um, you know, collapsing into complete despair. And I, I count myself incredibly fortunate on all those counts. Um, and then to be here now to be able to be talking to James about a concert that we're actually going to do in a week and a half's time with Yvonne. Um, it's, it, it has just been for me about as good as it could have been given the utterly horrible situation that we all face ourselves. So uh, that, that's how I've been. Oh, and I've made some videos about the history of opera, which everyone with nothing oh. can uh, find on YouTube. Um, Congratulations on those, John. And they've, they've achieved a really big audience. I'm just wondering, is there someone who's having to sublet part of their house so that there's a drill? It's John, I think. So the drill coming into it. <laughs> no? No, I'm glad to hear it. Yvonne, have you been? Um, oh, it's been very strange from a performing point of view. When, when lockdown started, or in fact a week before lockdown started, I'm sure you know all, all theatres were shut down from I think it was six o'clock on the, the evening of the 16th of March. And I was rehearsing Marjorie Figaro at that time at, uh, with the English National Opera. Um, they ha I was going to be taking over uh, toward the end of the run. So there was a whole batch of us who were rehearsing for the later performances. And of course we were sitting there and rehearsed on the Monday morning thinking, should we be here? Do we need to be here? Is it going to happen? And then in the evening, I happened to be staying with a friend who was working at Covent Garden and he messaged me and said, go home, everywhere's shutting at six, So from six o'clock. So um, that was very, very strange, just walking away um, and not knowing where it was going to end. And that was before the country was locked down. So it was very strange, but I also teach at the Royal Academy and, um, so I had eight students to continue teaching, which has kept me sane, I have to say, and I think has helped them as well. We've had lots of Zoom teaching. Took a while to get used to the technology because I'm not, I'm a bit of a numpty technologically, um, but actually we found a fantastic way of working and um, it's been really rewarding. The ones who are doing their finals, of course, their, their BMUSs and their MAs, it's been quite, well, very, very difficult for because some have submitted recordings, some have ha are doing them live, um, and they've got the worry of going into London to do it live. It's fine being in the academy because it's safe. It's the travelling, and um, so that it's it's been challenging but interesting. But from a singing point of view, it's been very odd. I and mean, I'm I'm very grateful. I live in the middle of nowhere. I have a large garden, and I've been growing vegetables till they come out of my ears. If anybody needs courgettes or potatoes or cucumbers or tomatoes, please give me a ring. <laughs> um, um, and that, especially because we had that glorious weather for the first couple of months, that did keep me from going completely bonkers. Um, it's getting a bit harder now, if, if the truth be told, because we're gradually seeing other people going back to some sort of normality and we know we can't. And right. I think that makes it more raw for us. Well, um, a lot of artists seem to be picking up contracts in Portugal and in France and um, things are starting in a sort of a way. Then when you read about the gigs are actually not that good. They're not, no. You know? And uh, they're not lucrative. I think people are doing it just in order to get back in the game. But think exactly. about the students, the ones in a final year coming out now. I so mean, hard. Not being able to audition anywhere. Yeah. Both. Well, they're doing online auditions and some people are good at that and some aren't. Some people have good equipment, others don't. Um, it's, it's, it's tough for them, I think. And, and it's in a way, it's seeing what they're going through. And, and I have to say, my own students have been incredibly positive and, and proactive, has, has probably kept my what could have been um, utter despair in perspective. Because seeing what they're going through at the beginning of their career, 
when you know I've I've fortunately there is some work in the diary to come and you know things that have been cancelled hopefully will be nudged forward um obviously concerts with with Holland Park um they haven't got that mm. you know they just don't know what's coming next and I I feel so deeply for them because it's you know this they should be so excited they should be you know sort of bursting with with excitement and, and willingness to go off into this amazing career which is always a challenge we know none of us ever go into it for security or or for the funds or whatever but to have no, nothing it must I, I can't imagine what how they must be feeling having put so much into it it's such a particular career in terms of uh, self-belief mm. self-belief that needs to sustain you in even you know modestly rewarding times and the rewards are modest at all times but um <clears throat> At present, I think we just have to hope that because they're young, they're robust. I mean, that is the only thing to hope because, yes. you know, they they can't make a mark and they're afraid of being a lost year in between yes. the last year that got to audition and then the next year the next. That coming up. Um, mm. It's a tough old time, but we want to think about um, positive things, I suppose. Yes. I, I mean, I actually, Zoom isn't that bad. We're going to... One thing that, you know, we have this series coming up of monodramas, which I'm fantastically excited about because, well, you know, I love performers and I like making stories with them. It's A1. I love doing Rodolinda because we absolutely took a razor, you know, we didn't take a razor blade to cutting, but we took a razor blade to the heart of peace and, and shows mm -hmm. like that, which are really great. But with monodramas, you're really looking for performers to step up, you know, to be elle in La Voix Humaine. Mm. You, you really have to step up, step forward, take the stage, bring yourself to it in the biggest way, and also restrain yourself from going away from the script, which is quite, she's a very particular woman. Um, and all, the, all of them will be like that. But actually, because most of the season is poetry, Dunn, Blake, uh, Svetayeva, Pushkin, what we're really enjoying is learning poetry together. And I mean, mm -hmm. learning it, and that you can do on Zoom. Um, and I'm hoping that the earliest musical coachings will be on Zoom, although I know that does present some timing challenges, but at least it will give, I hope it will give the singers the chance to be intellectual partners in the creation of it from day one. Yes. Rather than vessels to be filled. You know? Yeah, rather than just being a conduit, actually being a creative part. One of the joys I have to say through the teaching has been obviously because the sound world is so odd through this technology. It's amazing, but it's still strange. We've done a lot of poetry analysis, hmm. especially with my foreign students when they've been doing English song. Hmm. Um, well, I have a Japanese student who is astounding um, and she was singing Silent Noon, which is something I have been singing for 100 years. And we sat down and we literally analysed every word in that. And I was able to show her through walking around my garden, virtually every plant, blossom, tree that was mentioned in that song. And it brought that song so much more to my own heart mm. because we were able to just sit and spend an hour analysing it. Mm. And you never normally have that luxury. So I, I can get where you're coming from with that because it was a, a sheer joy for, for, for them and for me. And they've all actually, the isolation has been good for them because I've often said to them, you know, you think this job is all about buddy, buddy. Yes, it is when you're with people, but you can be away from home for four months and be in a hotel and on your own because everyone else that's working with you lives wherever it is you're working. And you have to go back every night and be self-sufficient and self-motivated and and they're, now they're getting it because they've had to during this. Yeah. Which, so it's been a really, um, it's been a really positive seeds. thing. You're as thick as thieves when a show is on, and yeah. I was thinking, bloody hell, what do they keep from home? And uh, and then of course it's over, and you're on to the next slot. <laughs> and of yeah. course I live with the singer, and I used to always be saying, well, why aren't you in touch with X, Y, and Z? Oh, well, I'm on to the next thing now. <laughs> and well, it is sad. Now I want to ask you some serious questions because you people are important. <laughs> Um, so, uh, no, James, don't go looking for the door because you'll be a mover and a shaker in this. So, okay, we want to know, we want to know a bit what the future is going to look like. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't have crystal balls, any of us, so we're going to have to take punts. But should it look different? I mean, I've been preoccupied with 
all the talk being about rescue and very little of it being about strategy because life changes. Opera is fantastic. It's amazing. It's wonderful. I've spent 30 odd years, God, it might be coming up to 40, 30 odd years, let's say, mm, might be more uh, working at it. But it can be quite change resistant. Mm. And then, of course, structures become change resistant. Uh, even while audiences are subtly changing in ways that we don't recognize. Mm. So I, I was thinking, golly, mm, this may be an opportunity to think strategically about what's the cake currently? And do you just you know, change the way the knife moves over the cake? Or do you think about slightly mixing up the ingredients? If that, that's a very bad metaphor. I'm ashamed of it already. But perhaps if you'd be able to just address the questions of, well, in opera terms, what do you think the future looks like as is? And sh is, should it look different? Should we be trying for something different or not? I mean, different doesn't mean that we don't do what we're doing. Yeah. It just means we might do it differently or in different groupings or. Can I have a quick go at that first? Mm. I... Please. I, no, I think that for, um, it's going to be, in my mind, the survival of the quickest rather than the fittest. It's just got to be people that can move mentally quickly and, and be ready to, to change. And, you know, I don't want to mean that James and I always say the same things because we have different opinions on some things, obviously. But I think that the two of us have always looked to to change even when things are going well. You know, I'm a big believer in when you're at the top of the game, change your game because you can't keep going like that. You know, you need to mix it up. And, and I think you're right. There, there'll be some opportunities there, although it's desolate, desolate at the moment. But, you know, a couple of things. One is that um, you've always looked to do different things and see what and be quick on your feet. We have. I think that um, in some way, even last week, I sort of enjoyed a bit of it that I, you know, we're talking about this. Um, it's not completely operetta, but, uh, you know, a light opera even in next week with with these guys. You know, I was able to ring John up and say, look, I'd like to do an evening of operetta. Can you put start putting a program together? And he said, yeah, when's it for? I was like, well, next week. Can we can we put it on sale tomorrow? And and there's a freedom that comes with that. That is just takes me back to when I was starting, you know, an idea, bomb, do it, get it done. And that that is quite a refreshing thing to fit to feel. Um, and because one of the good points of amongst a hell of a lot of bad points is that of course nearly everyone's available. <laughs> You can ring anyone up and they're available. Um, and so you can move quickly and just really be uh, creative on it. Now, there's limits to it because we haven't, you're trying to be safe and not keep people in a rehearsal room together or, you know, we're rehearsing on site on the day, you know, three hour rehearsal on the day, do the show later on that evening because we want to keep people distanced. But I think there's something quite thrilling about that as well. And I think so you've got to be quick to move on it and not not be in a turning circle of a, a, a juggernaut. You have to be ready to go, what can we do now? And um, I'm describing it to, a, to my team as a writing on water. As soon as I've created a shape of what I want, it's changed by the time I've finished it nearly always because the news has changed or the, you know, the vibe has changed and everything. And it's just about ready, being ready to have that strategy, but being ready to change it at a moment's notice if the things, if the things change. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're a creative industry and, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, blow us up all too much, but I think that we've always been, the, the, the two companies have always been ready to move quickly. And I think it suits people like us in some ways about just, okay, what can we do? How can we change now? And how can we do it? And I think that it's going to be that that's going to help, help us not survive, but you know, re, redo it. I think it's a shared, a shared responsibility for audiences and companies because we're going to be presenting things in different ways different repertoire and I think like the people that walk past their favorite restaurant and say oh I don't believe it's closed because no one went you know people have to go to stuff and I think it's going to be a shared responsibility and a, and a and a very different openness between companies and their supporters to say we're going to do this we really need you to come to this and obviously it's in we have to make it good and we have to price it correctly and make it safe but we have to get into people and say 
we're going to do this together. This is us all as a all as a group coming out of this together. And I think that's going to ultimately make us stronger as arts organisations with our audiences, you know, closer and more more coherent uh, as a, as an entity. The company and the audience being one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. That it's a it's a place for opportunists. I mean, survival. Yes. I, I'm sure it's very important. There are contexts in which it's all that counts, but we're in privileged positions and we need to flourish or we shouldn't go on. Yeah. Really, we need to be more creative or we don't. We shouldn't have the jobs we have. Yeah. Um, but James, you must have done as a company this or, or someone in your company has done it because obviously I didn't do it either personally, but this sort of survey to people about, um, you know, uh, Indigo did it, you know, about what would you go back to theatre, how would you do this? And and of course, that's great to have data, but it was so generalised amongst the, the entire industry. It's very difficult to find out about your audience. And so I was saying last week, this is this when we put this, the gig on last Saturday on sale, when in like um, 25 minutes or something. Um, that's raw data. That's just saying, would you come today? Not would you come in six months if it was safe enough, blah, blah. We're saying, would you come on Saturday in this? It's, you might get rained on. It's going to be this group of people, this group of singers, that's it. Do you want to come? And people really wanted to go. It's like it's raw data that we're getting on that rather than the imagined data. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, we have to look at real things and possibilities and your autumn season sounds fantastic. And I think it just needs to be ready to like shake that kaleidoscope up and then that shape at the end, you go, oh, that's the one I want. Great, let's do it. A part of my thinking is that we need to find out the people who are really dedicated because the programme calls for dedication um, because they're the people who will create the new audience for us. We have to have them creating it. It's vanity to think that professional marketing departments can create new audiences. Absolute vanity. It needs to come from people who already like converting others. And in order to do so, they have to feel some identification with you, some friendliness, some thought that they're listened to. Also, uh, I suppose because my current obsession is the act of listening as well as uh, the act of performing. What does listening look like? What does listening feel like to the performer? How can they tell if listening is happening? And all the work that we've chosen to do, or a a lot of it, is about listening. It's the way poets feel and composers feel. Who is listening? What do they hear? What is their experience which is different than mine with this material? Anyway, I'm, I'm waxing lyrical about something that I'm just very excited about. But I want to know what John and Yvonne think about are the things that that might change in a good way? Are there, are there, are there sprigs of hope in this? Are, are there areas in which you think we need to wipe the slate clean and, and think a little bit more from the audience up, mm. from supporters up to the product on stage? I think it, fr- from, from a performer's point of view, I think, um, it's a huge opportunity for things to be rethunk and maybe rethunk is that a word? Um, it's maybe, very good word. It is. Good. <laughs> and perhaps um, the the traditional and the hugeness that opera can have. I mean, obviously, it's fantastic when you have a grand opera with a massive stage and a huge set. But what I think works for both of your companies and other small com- smaller companies that I've worked for, and I don't mean small as in small companies but small in the venues is that the intimacy that you get with your audience we can see our audiences at Holland Park and with the the jobs we've done I remember going to BAM in in New York and being able to see the audience and it's like they are part of the performance and I think that is that makes it incredibly special for an audience it also makes it incredibly special for a performer because you look out I remember going back to Norma singing Castadiva and I remember on the first performance and I said to James, they're all going to go home after custody because that's all they think of. <laughs> and I looked out and I thought, oh, they haven't. They're with us. They're here. They're with us. Um, and they stayed with us. And and I was able because I was on stage a lot in that production. When I wasn't singing and I was able to look out and just sort of take the audience in and just see how they were feeling and that intimacy is incredibly special 
And I think some of the massive theatres lose that. Mm. So I think you do have a massive advantage um, with the smaller venues and the more intimate productions. And um, obviously the bigger theatres, they need the space for the huge choruses and the whatever. But it was, um, I, I just think there's a huge um, advantage and, and chance, opportunity to go forward in a, with this intimacy, with this um, bringing your audience with you rather than giving it to the audience. It's involving the audience I wonder emotionally too, and physically and musically and dramatically. I wonder too, if it's really in that context that we'll be able to make the new because what's frightening is that the new in this art form is basically ghettoized, you know, mm. uh, uh, big companies will do the odd one and they'll bankroll them because they know they're going to lose lots of dosh and give away seats and so on. Um, and then otherwise it's in small festivals and small ways and so on. Um, and when I was working in Ireland, I, did, I didn't used to get frightened about new things. I would program tons of new things. I think I commissioned 15 new pieces because, well, the audience had less in the way of predictable expectations. You know, it, we were, they were going to the opera. I'm not mm. saying they're unsophisticated. In, in fact, I think it's more sophisticated not mm. to be burdened by, by an idea of what everything should be like before yes. you even cross the threshold. Mm. Um, and so we were able to mix old and new. I, that's mm. not, and I can't think of a single other company that is actually doing that. Well, that mm. one's not anymore. That's actually doing that meshing of new and fabulous stuff by dead people. And I, I guess we might have to think of a context in which the new is really part of it. I don't know. What do you feel about that, John? I mean, I agree on, on all of those. I mean, everything you said, and obviously both ETO and Opera Holland Park, I think it's fair to say of, of the companies I've worked for have the closest relationship with their audiences. And I think that listening and that sense of dialogue is, is always there. Um, I think I would just to as I'm going to do, to, to remind mm. of the historical context, if you went to the theatre, if you went to the opera in 1870, you expected to see something new. If you, if you went to the opera in 1750, you expected to see something new. The, the world that produced the masterpieces of Handel and Mozart and Verdi and Puccini was a world in which every audience went to the theatre expecting to see something they'd never seen before. That's not where we are. Um, but at the same time, I think the difficulty I find when I, you, you talked about raw data, of course, I, I, I now have to look at all sorts of audience feedback about when people are f feeling like they're going to be ready to come back to concerts, what situations they're going to want, um, is the is the realisation of quite how diverse our audiences are. We, I think we neglect at our peril um, an appreciation of quite the range of people who come to opera. There are people who are ready to embrace um, more digital content. There are people who really don't. There are there are people whose appetite for the new is insatiable and there are people who who come to the opera for something reasonably familiar. The, the, the number of different um, desires that we have to uh, hopefully um, cater for and, and to inspire uh, people with um, is incredibly broad and so that 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 need for dialogue is really important i think the other thing is james talked about writing on water i feel like i have to have plan a plan b plan c plan d plan e for everything because so much is out of our control uh, you, you know you the great advantage you have at holland park is is control over the space whereas I am fighting in a lot of other contexts, and I'm sure James Conway, you are as well, with the fact that everything has to be has to go through a, a host venue. So I'm looking at concert planning for the autumn, where I know that some venues are not going to open and some rehearsal spaces are not going to open, and so the the the, the need to be responsive, to be fast, but also to to have you know your six plans all ready to leap out of the trap 
is incredibly important. So I think we are going to make things new because we're going to have to proceed in a really close dialogue with audiences all the time because that that partnership now is going to be the most important thing that we have. It's true. I mean, John, there'll be new places. Yeah, of course. Of course there will. And, and New places to rehearse and there'll be new partners. I mean, I, I sound blithe. I mean, I'm not so blithe. I worry about things. I stop at plan D, however. I refuse to go on to plan E because what the hell? You're going to have a new plan tomorrow for crying out loud. Let tomorrow's plan happen tomorrow. That's what I say because really, if you, you, I really think that sometimes at opera performances, something happens. It's kind of rare, but there aren't many places where anything happens that you buy a ticket for. You go along and you can be suitably, ed suitably edified. You know, your expectations may be met. And let's face it, a lot of the opera audience has a, 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 a very high degree of well-formed expectations. But to have your expectations not for six, that's worth paying money for, mm -hmm. to be changed. And if you can't be changed, to feel something other than indignation. Yeah. Because indignation is, of course, the once one reaches a mature age, that is the dominant emotion of every day. You just have to listen to the news to feel indignant. Uh, but um, I, I'm convinced there are different arenas for it. Mm. I'm convinced that if you love lyric theater, uh, we can find ways of doing things that will be really good and better and maybe more cost effective in a time of recession. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And that's why, you know, people like our two companies can move quicker because we haven't got the incredible infrastructure that some of the bigger companies have got and, uh, and are struggling with. But I think also it's down to us to, to lead rather than just wait to follow, you know, it's down mm -hmm. to us to, to, to create and, and I said to my uh, team yesterday, because most of them are on furlough, but we've got them all in now and again. And I was saying to them, you know, by us trying to be quick, by us trying to be first at things, by us trying to break barriers, we're gonna get things wrong. And you know what, that's okay. We're gonna get a couple of things wrong. Let's not worry about it. Uh, and because we're gonna get more right. And I think that you just have to then uh, change your mentality and say, yeah, be, be prepared to get some things wrong. And that, you know, we'd want to get it right, but let's be prepared to get some things wrong to try and challenge it and try and make new new work and new ways of seeing it. And I think that, you know, on Sunday, we've got a, we, we were taking, just before lockdown, we had a Pirates of Penzance that we commissioned by from John Savornin, who we both know, um, who did an hour long thing for kids, an intergenerational project it was. We stopped every 30 miles or so from London to Penzance and we had to stop about three venues short because of uh, we had to just, you know, stop performing. But we're coming back on scene with that. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, we've got 200 people. It's sold out today. Great, great. You know, and they're going to be sitting on cushions in the middle of our park. That's fine. You know, I think that when everyone was saying to me, like, we've got to have chairs like we had on Saturday, I said, it's OK, let's let's try a few different things to see we could the cushions on the floor might be better. For this all mm. you know let's just sure. Hasn't everybody been exercising during the lockdown anyway everybody's at home doing yoga i'm sure they'll be well set up for sitting <laughs> on <laughs> but, uh, my exercise has gone to mixing a martini and then drinking a martini um, <laughs> very balanced exercise uh, regime to make sure that you know it's still sometimes you know we can we can even do a negroni but i think that um no i think that is there's a level of um People now are, um, really want to see culture on, on screen, on Zoom, on live things, if we can do it. And I think it's just to us, up to us, not just to say, we're just going to throw this at you, but to put the same thought that we would put into uh, one of our big shows into that thing, be it a, a video uh, on, a, on a cinema thing or whatever. And we can and that we can get people on the side from that, but just treating it seriously at every, at every go. Mm -hmm. Saturday proved that, didn't it, really? Because it was bashing down with rain. It was pouring down. And, and every, we were standing there saying, no one's going to come. And then sort of half past five came and the gates opened and all these people walked in their wet weather gear and their shorts and their wellies and their brollies. And 
we were lucky it stopped raining but they'd have stayed if it hadn't they wanted to be there they wanted to hear live music and they wanted to feel live music because you do feel it it's not just visual is it it's it's physical as well and and that was really actually very very humbling mm. to those of us sitting looking at them all arriving and and then looking out when you're performing and I mm. there was a part during my aria and I suddenly thought I need to swallow because I'm going to cry you know I, just, I could feel this lump coming and I thought if I don't swallow I'm not going to be able to sing but I just had that because <gasps> it was it was really very special and it just proved how desperate people are for live performance again whether it be um, theatre whether it be um, orchestra whether it be opera whatever but people want it and to know to see that physically see that happening to see that need that want that desire was incredible and also very um uplifting mm -hmm. it was it was amazing you know those people who are keen um they're going to need to get to work mm -hmm. because when live performance starts a lot of people are very reasonably cautious afraid, protecting. It's not just a sign of fear, it can be a sign of prudence. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they may have different travel arrangements. Uh, I mean, I really think those who are enthusiastic are going to have to get to work making the new audience. Anyway, it had to happen. Because in truth, the audience wasn't renewing as fast as it needed to. You know, we always say we don't have empty seats, but we had a few. Uh, when we did, someone very kindly, as well as saying something happened at La Rondine at Holland Park, they said that something happened at Silver Lake um, uh, with English Touring Opera, and it did happen every night. Uh, uh, but honestly, if the people who were there, who took that punt on the title they didn't know, who had something happen that are going to need to be our ambassadors. I think Zoom is going to help with this. We need to facilitate it. But everyone needs to create 20 more opera attenders for us in any context. It's the only way in which this absolutely absurd model, because it is absurd now. Oh, yeah. It, it wasn't absurd when orchestras were servants. They still dress as servants in most places. Mm. Uh, when people were paid, you know, half nothing, unless they were a celebrity. I mean, I heard somebody today at this earlier meeting say, oh, we forget that all these great composers uh, were radicals. And I'm thinking, no, actually, they were really good at what they did. Some were radical, not many. They're called classical for a reason now. They they were making money out of what they did and they were persuading the very best audience to be devoted to what they did. The reason somebody fainted at a Handel opera was because Senesino was touted as this amazing castrated sex symbol. I mean, that's what made them faint. It was like a Beatles <laughs> concert, really. <laughs> Not because anybody was a radical, but honest to God, we, we're in a position, you and I, James, because we like audiences. I, I, I love working the foyer. I love talking to people. And a lot of the artists who work with us are good at working the foyer. We need to, we need to find and make our audience. Mm. It's no good talking about critics writing for newspapers. You know, they're read by 15 people. Who cares? Yesterday's chip paper. I'm, they're all very fine people. And I, you, I know that you're in with them all and they all love you. Let's <laughs> say. I, they don't love me. But, um, uh, uh, but I love you and rightly so. Oh, no, no, no. But uh, I just think we, we have to be close <laughs> to our audience. We have to hold our audience close. Now is our opportunity to do so and say, there's something great happening here. Share it because life's hard enough. Yeah. It has to be a symbiotic relationship, doesn't it? Mm. Because we, we all need each other. Mm. And we can't function without an audience and an audience doesn't exist without us. So, mm. you know, I, I did an interview, um, I was interviewed about 10 days ago by somebody who absolutely loves the arts in all forms. And she asked me some incredible questions. And the main one at the end of it, we both agreed that what we need as, as what performers need is for our audiences to shout that they don't want to lose the arts. Mm. 
because we're shouting against our friends' walls. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all saying, we can't lose the arts, it's amazing, but we need our audiences mm -hmm. to shout too, because they will be listened to more than we will. Mm -hmm. And 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 as performers, I mean, I think that the challenge in all of this is that we have to create art where we can make those connections. <clears throat> Excuse me, because at the minute, the the distancing, you know, everything that we do, everything that we're about, everything that we've spent our entire lives about, is closing distances between people. Everything we do is is about creating a sense of intimacy and, and connection with the people in front of us. Um, and so we're going to have to find ways of, of creating that sense of togetherness, even if physically we have to be further apart than we've ever been before. Um, it's, it's, it's going to go right down to the, to the artistic heart of what we do, not, not, not just the foyer, although I agree with you that I, I think the foyer and, and making contact with audiences and everyone who comes outside of the show is, is really important and something I love doing. But in the, in the performance itself, we have to create that, that sense of togetherness against all the odds. But John, don't you think it behooves us to, re, to examine, <clears throat> not re-examine, the whole notion of distancing? Because this word has come up because of a physical necessity in order to protect people's health. Mm. But there are other kinds of distancing that opera companies have become expert at doing. Creating distances, reinforcing distances, um, you know, uh, creating expectations, which are ultimately unrewarding expectations, not about openness, but about closedness. Oh, so-and-so missed her top B flat, therefore it was marred. And think, God's sake, how many notes did you listen to last night? <laughs> um, was there anything else on offer? Um, or um, indeed, you know, this very strange thing in England, I'm, it's estimable, it's a marvelous business, it's a good business model, but this, this business of associating opera with an elite who can attend, at, can drive fancy enough cars to park them outside stately homes and attend the estimable places. I'm not saying bad things about them. I'm just saying that that is distance. You know, I remember going to a few when I was driving an orange minivan. Um, and I'd be so ashamed to be parking out in front of places. And then I'd be looking at what the, the dinner jacket I had, which was always, I've only ever had a black suit. I've never invested in the other. And I've never been a master of tying a bow tie. And I'd be thinking, holy cow, there is nothing I dread so much as the supper interval. Because I'll have to become someone I'm not. Mm. Uh, I will feel that far from what's going on. I mean, cripes, it's bad enough at intervals sometimes if you can't just meet people who actually like what they're watching or mm. care for some reason. Well, I don't know, I'm exposing too many cards here. It's because well, I've had you and, I, well, you and I, James, you know, I think we, everyone knows there's a lovely comment here from Trevor, but you, know, you and I are known <clears throat> to, to be quite happy to talk to people. Um, you know, never knowingly shut up, either of us. But I think it's a nice thing. And it just says, okay, and, you know, and sometimes it challenges because people then, you know, sometimes I get the other side of it because I'm so open and accessible at the theatre. Then people do say, you know, oh, I hated to show. You know, yeah, okay. I asked for that, but... But I think that in, in the other side of that is it's okay because... They just stand in opinion. I have an opinion that I put it on. And, you know, I'm always quite open with people once the show has finished properly and people have gone, because I think you have to keep a, a support of it while it's on. But afterwards, if, if someone knows me well enough, I say, yeah, we didn't really hit it on that one. It wasn't wasn't our best. Um, but I, I know someone said to me uh, last year, uh, last summer, when we had, we had a show that wasn't that successful at all, someone said to me, oh, this is the... Um, the second show in six years of yours I haven't liked. And I, and I genuinely said, oh, thanks very much. And she said, no, no, I'm really disappointed. It's two. Uh, you know, I've done wow. I've well done. Come on, give me a break. But in the, the other side of that is that it's, um, I think it's the ownership that you've got to allow. If you're going to set yourself up like you and I and be out front, 
talking to everyone, you've got to accept you're going to get some things that you don't like. And that's fine too. That's yeah. fine. Why aren't they wearing cloaks? <laughs> I get that one all the time. Just a, a, what about a cloak? Um, uh, but I wanted to add, I, I, I probably came across the wrong way and I just have to be careful. You know, I'm in favor of big spectrum all things in all places, wearing all the clothes you want to wear. It's great to be able to dress up, dress down, do this, do that, do the other. I just think it's slightly unfortunate coming from outside as I do, that England is so associated, so firmly associated with the country house as the setting for opera. It's a fabulous setting for opera and there are marvelous theaters and outdoor places at these country houses. But I, if everybody here writes to the editor of The Archers at the end of this program, I will be pleased. Because the idea they present of opera is that it happens at Lower Loxley. It's very expensive. It's very exclusive. They make a few comments about sopranos and their high notes. And all the men on the show say, oh no, opera in their worst sort of drawl. And it's only a couple of socially mobile females who are booking the tickets. I think, God almighty, out of date, stop that. Go to, go to one of our performances in Durham, editor of The Archers, or, or, well, when we were going to Wolverhampton, isn't that quite close to where The Archers are supposed to be? In the most beautiful <laughs> theatre in England, the Grand Theatre in Wolverhampton, where sadly the audience is just gone. Um, but I, I just think a broad spectrum, broad church, moving forward, including the new, um, making a festival of the fact that we have so many really well-trained singers. Mm. We have some good voices, very, very beautiful voices, but nobody could say we don't have good training for artists here. No, absolutely. Really something to celebrate. Fantastic musicians, brilliant sight readers, quick rehearsers, but able to bring finesse. We've got all we need to be really distinctive in the field of opera and not imitating anybody else, yeah, yeah. being our own. But we have to be a bit braver, I think. Yeah. But I think, James, you know, you know what it's like, though, is if, if, you know, some people say to me about, um, well, uh, what dress, what's the dress code if they haven't been to our place before? And I always say a variation on the same thing that, you know, unless you're on stage, it doesn't really matter. You know, that it's, it's, it can't be that that's the thing. It can be that you can dress up or it can be you can dress down. The thing is, if you come to see the show and you're not in the show, then it doesn't really matter. That's my thing. It's just that I'm, I'm never going to stop people coming smart uh, if they want to or, or wearing shorts if they want to. I think it's sort of just irrelevant. And I think that's the problem that what you come in is the thing. If you come to see the show, because no one's looking at you, if you've got the right audience, they're just looking at what's on stage. If you're doing the show well enough. And I think that there is a bit of that around. And I think that, um, you know, I remember years ago, you know, cause I'm a bit chippy like, like you, James. I remember being in the opera house one night, years ago, this is a, admittedly quite a long time ago. We're, we're better now. But I remember sitting behind the couple then one of them said to the other one, I'm going to slum it on Saturday. I'm going to Holland Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good company. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Tap on the shoulder. Thanks for coming. Um, but I think that, you know, it's just that thing that if that's what you want, that's what you want. And if you want to come in and get engaged in um, well-told stories, you come to us or to you. And, and, and sometimes we get it wrong. And a lot of the time is we get it right. But I think that it's just down to the people they choose their companies. And I think it's, it's lovely on this, on this chat that we've obviously got a nice crossover that people do go to us both. And I think that's a really healthy and great thing. And, you know, you know, you always been supportive of me and me of you, but I think that there's, if people are going to opera, it's good for us all. It doesn't matter where you go, you know, ultimately you're in that circle and, you know, you're going to come to one of us at another time, but it's just, it's just getting through the door to, to see any of this, this thing and then not scaring them away by making it like you're welcome. You know, there's an, always talking to front of house staff, talk to people that immediately they come in, you know, and, uh, you know, just really make them feel welcome. Don't make them feel like this is a strange thing getting over that threshold. Make it be like, wow, you've just come back to a place that you're very welcome at. And I think that it's a different thing. Yvonne, to, to what extent do you think, and John, indeed, 
the audience informs your performance? Oh, that's a hard one. I think um, at Holland Park particularly, but just because it's light at the beginning, it's the, so you really can, you, obviously you can see everyone really clearly because it's daylight. Um, if the audience look restless or as we had last summer, people dying of heat stroke, because <laughs> we had a performance on the hottest night of the year, we're standing in ice buckets. Um, if you can, um, you, you can fit, it's palpable whether they are comfortable with you with the performance or if they don't like it because the body language you see their body language and what what the, the most rewarding thing to see is somebody who's maybe going oh it's ever so hot in here so they put their fan down and lean forward mm. and of course that has a huge effect on you because it means they've forgotten that they're sweating and feeling horrible and um and that they're, they're they're coming in with you so of course that must inform your performance then because you want to give you're already giving but you want to give more and you want to give more so that they'll come more to you. And so I think from that point of view, visually at Holland Park, you can see that. But in, in, in the venues that I performed in with you, because they're smaller, you can feel, again, it's palpable. There's a feel of support from the audience. And if people, if when they get restless, I mean, I don't think I've ever had it in a show I've done with you, but when people get restless, they fidget and you hear that mm. or you see it. And especially when people are wearing glasses because their glasses move and they catch the light and you can see that happening. <laughs> um, but if, you, a, don't, if, you, if you know that they're with you, then of course it makes you give even more. That thing of being with you, I think that's goodwill, isn't it? Yes. Can you imagine what could be done in government if there was a feeling of goodwill in the House of Parliament? Yes. What a place would we be living in? Oh my goodness. Utopia. John, what do you think? Well, my obviously as a performer, my experience is, is, is different because I've got my back to the audience. So I don't get that first-hand um, sense of, of, of feedback. Primarily, I, I get it from whoever turns up to the pre-show talk. But John, um, have you never been offered sweets by the people in the front row? <laughs> I, James, I really try to behave myself. <laughs> But we used to, everyone, do you not remember in Valley Shannon? That was traditional. They were <laughs> in the front row and they'd always walk the sweets to the conductor. Oh, would you like this, sweetie? <laughs> going to a show, dear. <laughs> and make sure that, you know, beat three doesn't take anybody's knees out is much more important. <laughs> um, but, I mean, as you say, at Holland Park, you have the, you have the sight of the audience. And, 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 of course, last year I was in the immensely privileged position to be conducting only one half of a double bill. So I got then to be, uh, I got the opportunity then to be straight out into the audience and to, to enjoy talking to them about it straight away. Um, but I, I'm obviously, a, a, tend to be at one more remove. I think, like, like both of you, I get the comments back after the event about what people did or didn't like I tend it tends to be a, a slightly more distanced conversation but I think what both of both of your companies have that a lot of the others don't is a is that you've won a trust you've both won the trust of audiences to take chances and that's what we all have to be able to do uh, and we're back to that relationship with audiences that that once you've once you've shown that you can move people once you've shown that you can do something really transformative then then the worry about what the name of the piece is or whether they've heard of the singers all starts to pale into insignificance because you've you've won a readiness to take a chance you can kind of kind of tell can't you well this is vain performers talk we'll have to open this up but do you know when a performance ends and there's a moment of silence before the applause begins partly because maybe people don't know it's over uh, it's not one of these operas that ends in a terrible loud way, which is, you know, a very applause harvesting. I can never bear these ones that end really loudly. Well, I mean, you have to earn it. But um, it, that moment of just uh, taking it in before giving, it turns applause into a genuine response rather than an obligation before you get the bus. Um, especially if you're not doing all those absurd curtain calls that people do in opera. But uh, th there's a feeling of, of goodwill and gratitude that I think if we could bring that to more walks of life, oh, we'd be living in a very different place because people sitting beside each other share something in different ways. 
yet respond univocally. And they take a second to feel before they do it. Maybe I poeticize it too much, but I felt that way. I remember almost every performance of King Priam, which is of course a masterpiece uh, and rarely heard, extraordinarily generous in its text, in its music, in its aspiration for peace, uh, in all of its characterizing, in the demanding vocal writing. And I just felt after each performance that everyone knew Mm. how great it was for a mm. moment yeah. and something shifted. I, I live for moments like that, Yeah, yeah. really. James, I don't want to jump the gun here, but should we make a push to take the, over the government then? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I have made overtures, but so far, I mean, really. <laughs> should we take some questions? It's more to the point. Yeah, I think that'd be lovely before um, we have to depart. We've got a question actually we had before the... Uh, chat and has just been put in the live chat uh, from with, from Simon. Uh, how uh, confident are both of you that you'll benefit from the um, the government's bailout? Uh, James Clutton, do you want to? Uh, I personally don't think we'll see a penny of that. I, I can't imagine that we'll see a penny of that. No, uh, James, it's actually all coming to us. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I did when well, I made I'll, that overture. I'll some of you at some point. Then. I'll, I'll, I'll pass some your way in an envelope. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, I want to say that we're sublimely confident that our virtue and and uh, and distinctive voice will be recognised, and the power and influence of our audience will be feared by everyone in government, and that they will respond to us immediately. But I don't even know how we can apply yet, and it's not bailout. I, I'm not in favor of rescue. I'm in favor of strategy. Everything that the, that the government's doing with money needs to be viewed strategically for a new future, not rescuing a past. Uh, that's my feeling about it. I don't know if it's shared at all, but I, since I want to be part of the future, well, my palm will be out. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there'll be some incredible hoops to jump through for that and um and i think that it will just be you know it looked great obviously to a degree um but i think it's it's only uh, even though it's an incredible amount of money we just look at it it's 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 meant to cover so many different things and so many big organizations and very wide across the entire art so very soon that doesn't look quite as much money as it as it looks when you see it written down i um, think that it has to be uh you know if you get 10 pounds Will nine pounds ninety nine make its way to artists and fees? Yeah. Then it's money well spent. Yeah. That, that I think needs... I think James is right though. You have to look at it not as better, not only strategy, but I think it needs to be looked at as investment, and that sort of money needs to be investment, and that sort of in that, not maybe quite that, but that sort of money needs to come into the arts. Um, you know, more generally as investment, and I think that's the thing. It's a we all talk about, well, I don't so much, but about the economic benefits and which is a great one, but I think you have to look a bit higher. You know, you have to, um, you have to aim a bit higher and want it for, for the greatness of what it does to people and how it makes them feel. And if we can't get from people like that, then we, then we shouldn't be in our jobs really. Mm. Uh, a fun question here from, uh, which James has just answered in the chat, but from um, Rosie. Uh, could there be a possible creative collaboration between Holland Park and ETO in the future? Shaking your hand, James. Yeah, yeah, we've, 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 we're we've in we're in conversations. We, uh, we haven't got the right thing yet, but we will do soon, I'm sure. One of these days. One of these days. Uh, Timothy Lloyd has asked, um, <laughs> what's the name of the cat? No. <laughs> this, is, this is Sherlock. Sherlock. A very fine name for a cat. Mm -hmm. And just if people weren't following the chat, uh, we had some really good um, suggestions for what John looks like. We had George the Fourth, we had Queen Victoria, um, Bodicea, George the Fifth, or Tsar Nicholas. And I think maybe Tsar Nicholas. Oh, we're getting a bit different now with. Yeah. Brad, <laughs> I think Jeannie, uh, Jeannie had a question. Yes, I'm sorry to be doing it this way. I'm not very good at all of this, and I can't figure out how to get my chat questions in the stream. So I'm I'm sorry. I'm looking um, at you. Just just uh, with John, by the by, I was thinking about Rasputin there when he was at his hair towel. 
But anyway, do you know about the public campaign for the arts? Maybe you do, but I belong to that. And that is specifically aimed at audiences and you know, campaign and is continuing to do so to get responses from audiences to say to the government, um, we want, we need the arts. So what Yvonne was saying before about that, you know, that sense that people are coming back because they're parched for live entertainment is exactly what we're trying to use in, in this campaign. If you want more information about it, if you, mm. I can, I can send it to, I can send the link to someone. Um, Please do. Who, who would I send it to? You can send it to me or you can send it to Bradley. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Jay Conway at englishtouringopera.org.uk. Okay. And it's Bradley, Bradley.travis, isn't it? The same yeah. formula. Right. I'll do Thanks, that. Jeannie. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, great. Well, I Rasputin, I have to point out, someone has just, we have Stella, isn't it Stella? Oh, Simon has said Rasputin. I want to point out to you that it, should we be producing as per normal in the spring and we do the golden cockerel, you know that it, uh, Rimsky, it was quite dangerous for him when he wrote it because it was the time of the Russo-Japanese War and it's a satire on the misgovernment and mismanagement of Nicholas II. So the personage of the astronomer, which is a tenorino part, so it's impossibly high, it's sort of, you can think of a part of an anatomy that you might want to attack in order to make the sounds that you need to make as a man. Um, uh, that, that part is going to be, Rasp he will be a secret Rasputin. And the queen of Shamaka, normally exoticized in a way that I think is a little bit sexist uh, and also a little bit uh, occidentalist, uh, uh, at the moment, it will be Alexandra fied, if that means anything to you. But Rasputin will appear. <laughs> Very good. Brilliant. Well, I think I think on that note, I think uh, we will look to uh, wrap this up. Uh, thanks so much to all of you for coming today, and thank you so much, James, Yvonne, and John, for your um, time and uh, just your goodwill of being here. We're having a lovely time with these in conversations. We really love you coming and spending time with us. Uh, it's it's brilliant, and the chat was lovely today to see all these fun comments and really lovely comments about both Opera Holland Park and English Touring Opera that we're we're all very grateful for. Um, they're continuing these in conversations every Wednesday at six o'clock into September, so do keep joining us. Um, so from me and all of us, uh, it's bye. Have a lovely evening. Great to see bye. you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being so gorgeous, James. Oh, <laughs> that's him you mean. I'm coming, James. <laughs>